Well, that's a little bit different way to open up the program today, but we wanted to jazz things up a little bit. Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie. Boy, that is kind of fun yeah. rocking music yeah. there, isn't it? And and things are really hopping down here in Louisiana right now because it is Mardi Gras season. And everybody who's into things like that is getting ready for carnival. But, you know, even those of us who aren't into it, we're still stuffing our faces with king cake and looking forward to a day <laughs> or two off school or work. Well, and if you're like me and all of that sounds a little unfamiliar, I've never been to Mardi Gras. I've never even been to Louisiana, but don't worry because that's our topic tonight. Mardi Gras, Ash Wednesday, and Lent. And we're going to bring you up to speed on all of them because they're based on some bad theology. And we all want to be sure to stay away from those, even if we've never heard of these observances. And if your friends and loved ones who participate in Mardi Gras, Ash Wednesday, or Lent, well, this episode might help you get a better understanding of what they're doing and how to share biblical truth with them. Now, Mardi Gras, Ash Wednesday, and Lent are all connected, and all three of them are connected to Easter. So, Michelle, would you lay out all of that on a calendar for us so we can start seeing how they're related to each other? Yeah, that's a good idea of a good way to start. So working backwards on the calendar, this year, 2022, Easter or Resurrection Day or Resurrection Sunday, as you please, is April the 17th. And Lent is the 40-day period, not counting Sundays, leading up to Easter. Then you back up a little bit further, Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent. So you start with Easter, back up 40 days, and Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, is on March the 2nd. Mardi Gras is the day before Ash Wednesday. So Mardi Gras is on March the 1st. It falls a little late this year. Most of the time, Mardi Gras is in February. Now, in order to explain to you what all of these things are, I think it would be easiest to go in reverse order as well. So Easter, then Lent, then Ash Wednesday, then Mardi Gras. So Amy, you get the joy of telling us what Easter is all about. Yes, joyful indeed. I would love to do that. Uh, first, I do want to say, though, that we are using Easter Sunday and Resurrection Sunday interchangeably in this case. There's nothing sinful about saying the word Easter, just so you know. Uh, so that could go either way. Now, we mentioned that we are going to be talking about some bad theology coming up, but this is the part with the good theology. So if you're a Christian, you already know what Easter is all about, even you know if you've never even heard of a holiday named Easter or Resurrection Sunday, and that's because it's all about the resurrection of Jesus. And you can't really be saved without knowing about and believing in Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. So let's take a look at that in Scripture. Now, we all know that Jesus was crucified in our place for our sins on a Friday. That's why we observe Good Friday every year before Easter Sunday. He was crucified and buried on a Friday, and he was in the tomb on Friday. Friday, Saturday, and early Sunday. You can read about that in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. But Jesus didn't stay in that tomb. So let's pick up the story in Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. 
And ladies, that is why we celebrate Easter. It commemorates the day Jesus rose from the dead. It's also why Christians worship on Sunday instead of Saturday, as God's people did before Jesus's resurrection. Every Sunday is sort of like a mini resurrection day. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amy, I I just wish we could stop this episode right here. I, I mean, know. I hate to go on to the bad theology. I just want to wallow around yeah. in the good theology for a little Me while. Me too. <laughs> but okay, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, still working backwards from Easter, as we said, uh, as we said earlier, Lent is a 40 day period, not counting Sundays, leading up to Easter. If you're familiar with Lent, you might think it's just a Catholic thing, but it's not. Lent is observed by Catholics, but also a few Protestants, uh, though, you know, it's much more rarely that Protestants observe, um, observe Lent. Uh, historically, Lent is supposed to be a period of repentance, penance, fasting, and self-denial. The aspect of Lent that people tend to be most familiar, familiar with is the idea of giving something up for Lent. Maybe you give up watching TV or chocolate, or a lot of people give up smoking or eating meat for, for the duration of Lent. And that would be your, you know, sort of like your fasting and your self-denial right there. Lent was originally intended to be a period of time that focused on the pursuit of holiness. So, you know, repentance, fasting, self-denial, that all sounds pretty biblical, right? Well, theoretically, it could be, but the way Lent is actually practiced, it's usually not. Some of the fundamental components of Lent, you know, repentance, fasting, the pursuit of holiness, all that, those things are in and of themselves biblical. Repentance and holy living should be practiced by Christians every day. And of course, you're free to practice biblical fasting if and whenever the Holy Spirit might convict you to do so. However, Lent is not mentioned or even hinted at in the Bible. And of course, any Catholic observance of Lent or anything else is fundamentally unbiblical because the Catholic religion itself is unbiblical. The Catholic observance of Lent is fruit of the poisonous tree, you might say. But even for Protestants, if a church requires that its members observe a man-made religious ritual, that would be an unbiblical aspect of Lent, too. Colossians 2.16 says this, Therefore, let no one which means no one, including your church or your pastor, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. And then same chapter, Colossians 2, we skip down to verses 20 to 23. And here's what that says. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? I mean, think about as you think about those words, think about the practice of giving things up for Lent. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Verse 22, referring to things that all perish as they are used, like, you know, like all those things that are given up for Lent. According to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Scripture teaches us how we're to worship God, and there's no scriptural command for a description or a description of anything remotely resembling Lent in the New Testament church. In fact, that passage in Colossians makes a pretty decent argument against Lent. So it's unbiblical to require this worship practice of Christians. It's also unbiblical for any church to imply or to teach that participating in this man-made ritual earns favor with God or absolves or, or makes up for sin. We cannot earn favor with God by our behavior. We cannot make up for our sin by our own actions, and our sin cannot be absolved through acts of penance. That's Christianity 101. Our sins can only be atoned for, and we can only be in right standing with God through Christ's finished work on the cross. And we receive that gift of 
forgiveness, absolution, and atonement through repentance and faith in Christ, not by our own good works. If you're in Christ, all of your sins, all past, present, and future are forgiven. If you're not in Christ, none of your sins are forgiven. Either way, there's nothing you can do behaviorally about that. Forgiveness of sin is all of Christ and all on Christ, not on you, not even a little bit. And finally, to teach that there is a special time of the year set aside for repentance and holiness is unbiblical. Christians are to walk in holiness and repentance every single day. We don't save it all up for the 40 days prior to Easter. And the repentance and holiness that you might practice during Lent isn't any more efficacious to your relationship with God than the repentance and holiness you practice any other day of the year. It's not like Lent is... I don't know, extra strength repentance and holiness and the rest of the year is just like regular repentance and holiness. So it's not it's not a, you know, a booster shot to your holiness and repentance or anything like that. Right. Um, few verses that apply to this. First Thessalonians 4, 7, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. God has called us to holiness as a way of life. Second Peter 3.11b, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Matthew 3.8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, not just once a year, but every day. So should Christians participate in Lent? Well, Catholic observances of Lent, no, you shouldn't be participating in any aspect of of Catholicism. And and we realize that y'all will probably have some questions about Catholicism, and we are planning some upcoming episodes to explain to you some of the unbiblical aspects of Catholicism. So sit tight and and, and wait, we'll be there. (laughs) Um, Some doctrinally sound churches, uh, getting back to whether or not Christians should participate in Lent, We know that some doctrinally sound churches and and individuals freely choose to set aside a time of biblical fasting, prayer, and worship in anticipation of Easter. We want to be careful not to make a law where there is no law in Scripture. So for Christians who... For Christ, yeah, for Christians who observe Lent in this way, you know, in prayer and in fasting and in worship, looking forward to Easter, as long as it's observed in keeping with scriptural principles and none of the unbiblical aspects of Lent are part of it, it can be a valuable and meaningful time of respite and renewal with the Lord, just as it could be at any other time of the year. I would just urge anyone or any church who's thinking about having some sort of some sort of biblical form of Lent to ask yourselves two questions and really give them some prayerful consideration. First, why are we doing this? You know, have some good biblical reasons for it. And then second, why do we feel like we have to do this at this time of the year when it could be so easily confused with the Catholic observance of Lent? Why couldn't we do this at some other time of the year? That's a really good point, Michelle. And for people who have uh, been Catholic, who are coming out of Catholicism or have done that, as I have, just the idea of celebrating Lent, even if it's done biblically, can be a real trigger, can be a real stumbling block for people. That's right. And I've witnessed that happening in churches before. Uh, People who have been there, uh, you know, your your toes start to curl because you realize how, you know, are we going back to Rome? You really want to ask yourself those questions. And so for all my sisters listening who have been Catholic like I was, and some of you know my story, I came out of the uh, whole pagan Unitarian thing and started dating a boy who he was born and raised Catholic and very traditional Catholic in our hometown. And uh, some of you have personal experiences with Lent and Ash Wednesday. And I just remember one of our first dates, a group of us went to do some bowling at the bowling alley locally and had some pizza. It was a Friday night during Lent. And he said, oh, no, I can't eat that pizza. It's got pepperoni on it. And uh, <laughs> you know, this boy that I had fallen in love with, I looked at him and I just picked up a piece of pizza, looked him in the eye and just chomped down. So I just, uh, you know, I know, but... 
I didn't mean to torture him, of course. Well, maybe I did a little bit. But, you know, we had a lot to learn back then. Our eyes were not open. And praise the Lord that he did bring us out of that. So just going to throw that out there because uh, we really do know that a lot of you do have Catholic relatives and friends and loved ones who are still in the Catholic Church. And like Michelle said, we are putting together a program, an episode we're dropping next week. So do stay tuned for that. We want to take our time and, and really expand that out, bring up those biblical topics that Rome disagrees with, and we disagree with Rome on that. So stay tuned. So let's move on and talk a little bit about Ash Wednesday. Since Ash Wednesday is the ritual that kicks off the Lenten season. Does that mean it's unbiblical and, you know, that Christians shouldn't partake in it? Uh, what does that mean? So let's take a look. Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent. You know, it's, it's primarily observed by Catholics as well as some Protestants. Ashes are applied to the forehead in the shape of a cross to indicate repentance and that the recipient uh, will begin the Lenten fast the next day. Now, this further description of Ash Wednesday ritual is taken from the article Ash Wednesday at the website Catholic Online. As the priest applies the ashes to a person's forehead, he speaks the words, Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Or the priest may speak the words, Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, priests administer the ashes during Mass, and all are invited to accept the ashes as a visible symbol of penance. Even non-Christians and the excommunicated are welcome to receive the ashes. The ashes are made from blessed palm branches taken from the previous year's Palm Sunday Mass. It's important to remember, the article says, that Ash Wednesday is a day of penitential prayer and fasting. Some faithful take the rest of the day off of work and remain home. It is generally inappropriate to dine out, to shop, or to go about in public after receiving the ashes. Feasting is highly inappropriate. Small children, the elderly, and the sick are exempt from this observance. It's not required that a person wear the ashes for the rest of the day, and they may be washed off after Mass. However, many people keep the ashes as a reminder until the evening. And again, that came from the website Catholic Online. So, is Ash Wednesday biblical? Well, yes and no, but mostly no. And for most of the same reasons, Lent is generally unbiblical. So let's briefly review those reasons. First of all, like Lent, Ash Wednesday is not mentioned or instructed in the Bible. It is a man-made religious ritual. Catholicism tries to connect applying ashes to the forehead with the mentions of repenting in sackcloth and ashes in the Bible. But these are all Old Testament mentions. No one in the New Testament is described as having repented in sackcloth and ashes, and there are no instructions to the church nor to Christian individuals to make ashes any part of repentance. As with Lent, any Catholic observance of Ash Wednesday is really fundamentally unbiblical because the Catholic religion itself is unbiblical. And Ash Wednesday is observed during Mass, which has many additional unbiblical components, as many of you know. But in addition to the unbiblical similarities between Ash Wednesday and Lent, Ash Wednesday's forehead ashes are the exact opposite of the humble way Christ teaches us to fast. In Matthew six sixteen through 18, Jesus taught us this, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, there's another article titled Ash Wednesday, and we found this on the website aboutcatholics.com, and that article attempts to explain how Ash Wednesday does not violate this passage by saying, quote, by publicly wearing ashes, we are not trying to draw attention to our fasting. Rather, we are reminding ourselves and the world around us of the importance of turning away from sin and of the fact that this life does not last forever, unquote. 
But you know, lady, scripture already tells us how to call the world to repentance, and it reminds sinners of eternity. And it's not by painting ashes on your forehead. It's called the gospel and the Great Commission. And it's, you can find this in Matthew twenty eight eighteen. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Lady, share the gospel. That's how we remind ourselves and the world around us of the importance of turning away from sin and of the fact that this life does not last forever. The fundamental components of repentance and the pursuit of holiness that are supposedly the basis of Ash Wednesday are biblical and should be practiced by all Christians every day. But the rest of Ash Wednesday is unbiblical and Christians, we believe, should not participate in it. You know, Amy, I think one of the foundational problems that Catholicism and Christianity as well seem to have is that we don't appreciate the simplicity of Scripture's instructions to individual Christians and and to the church. You don't have to go through all this rigmarole. You don't have to fancy things up with pomp and circumstance. Just repent. Just share the gospel, just pray and go to church and study your Bible. You know, it's not six flags over Jesus. It's very simple and plain. So finally, let's talk about Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is French for Fat Tuesday. It is the day before Ash Wednesday, and it has its roots in Shrove Tuesday, which is similar, but quite a bit more tame. Amy, this is the pancake thing I was telling you about. (laughs) When Amy and I were talking about putting this episode together last week, I mentioned Shrove Tuesday, and all I could remember about it at the moment was that it was about the pancakes. So before we go (laughs) any further into Mardi Gras, let's hear about its roots. And why don't you tell us what you found out about Shrove Tuesday and pancakes, Amy? Well, Michelle, I'm just a little bit disappointed that uh, bacon wasn't mentioned <laughs> anywhere in this. I am a, a bacon fan, as many of you know. But uh, but it's lit, you know. <laughs> I guess any holiday that centers around pancakes has got to be good, right? Well, the pancakes might be good, but not the theology behind Shrove Tuesday, I'm afraid. Shrove Tuesday is also the day before Ash Wednesday. It's observed mostly by Catholics, but also a few Protestants, such as Anglicans, Episcopalians, and Lutherans. The word shrove is the past tense of the English word shrive and refers to receiving absolution for one's sins through confession and penance. Since Ash Wednesday is the day when these folks go to churches, confess their sins, do penance, and receive absolution, Shrove Tuesday is part of a preparation day anticipating Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent. Now, sometime around A.D. 600, Pope St. Gregory the Great handed down an edict stating that Christians should not eat any meat or animal products during Lent. So on Shrove Tuesday, everyone would make pancakes to use up their milk and eggs and butter, all of those animal products that would spoil during the 40 days of Lent. That is why Shrove Tuesday is sometimes called Pancake Tuesday. A lot of churches have pancake breakfast that day to celebrate. And of course, American culture couldn't let churches have all the fun, right? Because who doesn't love pancakes, right? So somebody decided to declare Shrove Tuesday National Pancake Day in the U.S., And that is uh, kind of what made up the marketing plan made in heaven for IHOP. And no, this time, uh, we're not talking about the International House of Prayer, but indeed the International House of Pancakes. IHOP decided to get in on the act too. And that's why every year around this time, you're going to see ads for IHOP's free pancake day to celebrate National Pancake Day. Uh, Up here in Wisconsin, Michelle, there's a Polish bakery where people drive for hours from surrounding states just to enjoy Ponchki. Some people even pronounce it Punchki. But that's what we call Shrove Tuesday, Ponchki Day. A Ponchki is one of the most delicious pastries I have ever had. And uh, they are indeed stuffed with, uh, you know, jams or creams or fruits, uh, whatever it is. And then they deep fry these little guys uh, and they roll them in sugar. They're, they're kind of like 
donuts, I think, stuffed donuts. And last year, uh, this bakery that's about 20 minutes from my house served <laughs> up more than 34,000 of these delicious pastries. Count me in. <laughs> Yum. But uh, getting back to Pope St. Gregory, the Pope required St. Augustine of Canterbury to enforce his edict in England. And from there, the practice of Shrove Tuesday spread throughout Europe. Each country used up its milk, butter, and eggs in its own unique pastries. England celebrated Pancake Day, while in France, they made crepes and waffles and a uh, dessert that came to be known as King Cake, I, which I understand is now a hallmark of Mardi Gras. Is that right, Michelle? That's right. We have our own delicious pastries down here. We, I think we're going to have to, you know, trade off one day, one year I'll come up there and I'll have ponchkeys and you'll come the next year you'll come down here and have king cake. Sound like a deal? <laughs> king cake is pretty much the only aspect of Mardi Gras that I participate in and it is absolutely delicious and it sounds a little bit like ponch keys but not quite on on a king cake the cake part is sort of a, it's a cross between maybe a cinnamon roll and cinnamon bread in texture and they take the dough and they form it into an oblong ring that's usually about at least the ones you get in the grocery store are usually about the width of a dinner plate and maybe a few inches longer you you can get a, a plain one with no filling, or you can get one that's filled, which is kind of filled like a jelly donut. And they fill those things with just about every kind of sweet filling you could imagine. My favorite is blueberry cream cheese, but there are a lot of other fruit fillings. Um, there's praline. Some of them fill them with n Nutella, uh, cookie dough. There's turtle filling, coconut, Bavarian queen cream, um, sweet potato, you know, bakeries try to come up with new fillings every single year. And trust me, nothing is too weird. I've seen some really weird fillings that you probably would never want to eat. But anyway, so they, they do that. And then king cakes are topped with icing that's very similar to cinnamon roll icing, but it's really closer to a glaze than a frosting. And then after they put the icing on, then they sprinkle on um, in, in different sections. They'll sprinkle on green sugar, yellow sugar, and purple sugar on the top of it. And green, purple, and gold or yellow are the colors of Mardi Gras. So that's why they do it. Green stands for faith. Purple stands for justice. And gold stands for power. Um, king cake season, well, I call it king's, king cake season. It's really Mardi Gras season. <laughs> the king cake season for me kicks off on January the 6th and runs through Mardi Gras. January the 6th is Epiphany, as probably a lot of our listeners know. And that is the day that commemorates the wise men or the kings finding Jesus. So when you buy a king cake, it comes with a little plastic baby. And you stick it into the cake from the bottom, and then whoever finds the baby in their piece of king cake, like the wise men found Jesus, has to bring the next king cake to the office or the church or family gathering or wherever you're at, you know, where you're eating king cake. So, so <laughs> I'm sorry. So you bite into a piece of cake and then all of a sudden you chomp down on a little yeah, plastic you, baby? <laughs> you have to be careful because <laughs> oh. you could break a tooth or something. They used oh, to, they, the way they used to do it is they would put the baby in the cake at the store. So <laughs> even the person who bought it wouldn't really know where it was. But I think what happened was is that too many people bit down on it and broke a tooth or hurt their mouth or something like oh, that. And there were baby. probably, yeah, <laughs> and there were probably some lawsuits or things like that. So now the baby comes separately. And you put you either put it in yourself or you choose not to put it in if you're concerned people might choke or something like that. But seasoned you know, king um, cake. There are no babies in punch keys. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, seasoned king cake eaters know, you know, to be careful and maybe kind of squish around your little piece of cake first and make sure that it's not in there so you don't bite down on it. Yeah. Or worse, you know, if you if you like yours warmed up a little bit and you stick yours in the microwave, you don't want the baby in there if you put your king cake in the microwave. Oh, so no, a <laughs> most baby. of us know what we're doing. <laughs> that sounds fun and delicious. But you know, like I said earlier, the pancakes and king cake are you know good, but the theology they're associated with are not. And one of the main unbiblical theologies associated with Shrove Tuesday, as well as Ash Wednesday and Lent, in some ways is penance. Penance can be uh, self-imposed, but usually it's a punishment for your sin imposed on you by the church. 
It normally consists of repeating certain prayers, giving offerings, uh, charity work, or self-denial. You perform whatever the act of penance is in order to show that you're really sorry for your sin and uh, to make up for your sin. Now, this is to earn your way back into God's and the church's good graces. Once you've performed your act of penance to the priest's satisfaction, he absolves you of your sin and you are right with God and the church again. Again. <laughs> oh boy, that is not even a little bit biblical. In fact, that flies in the face of pretty much the whole Bible. First of all, no man can forgive or absolve sin. Think back to the Gospels. The Pharisees got a lot of things wrong, but they did get that part right. Remember back in Luke 5 uh, when Jesus healed the paralytic? His friends lowered him down through the roof, and Jesus said to him, Your sins are forgiven. And what was the first reaction of the Pharisees? Well, they said in their hearts, who can forgive sin but God alone? They were wrong to think that about Jesus because Jesus is and was God. But if they had thought that about any ordinary human being, they would have been right. Only God can forgive sin. Penance puts the priests in the judgment seat of God. The idea of penance is also unbiblical because it's not the way God operates, nor the way God has instructed the church or individual Christians to operate when it comes to dealing with sin. God never instructs the church to assign acts of penance to a repentant believer. When we sin and we're convicted of our sin, we repent to God and he forgives us. We confess our sin to the people we've sinned against and we ask their forgiveness. We also might need to uh, confess our sin to others who weren't directly affected by it, but might need to know about it. Penance is also unbiblical, and it's an unbiblical view of God's punishment of sin. God punishes sin in two ways. If you're an unbeliever, he punishes your sin with an eternity in hell. If you're a believer, he punished Jesus for your sin on the cross, freeing you from having to take that punishment yourself. There's no in-between sort of punishment for sin that God delegates to the church. Now, you might be thinking, what about somebody in the Bible like Zacchaeus? Didn't he do penance for his sin by you know, paying back the people he defrauded? No, he didn't. He didn't repay those people in order to earn forgiveness. He repaid them out of the overflow of joy in his heart that came from knowing that he had already been forgiven. And he made restitution to the people he had directly sinned against. You know, acts of penance required by today's priests often have no connection to the people you've sinned against. Jesus didn't impose repayment on Zacchaeus as a punishment for his sin. Zacchaeus decided of his own free will to make restitution and reconciliation as an act of worship for the God who saved him. We cannot earn forgiveness or absolution for our sins through penance, and it's not the church's place to dole out punishment for our sins. All of that is God's place and God's place alone. That is so true. And I'm so glad we had some good theology right there. I thought it was going to be all bad theology, but God's forgiveness of sin, that is good stuff right there. That is so, oh, praise God for that. And But sadly, that topic, sin, is all too appropriate when we're talking about Mardi Gras, because most aspects of Mardi Gras are sinful. What Shrove Tuesday started, Mardi Gras finishes in a big way. Feasting on all the stuff you couldn't eat during Lent, that's the fat part of Fat Tuesday. And that ballooned into drunken revelry, sort of a last hurrah for getting all the sin and debauchery out of your system before you have to start, quote unquote, being good for Lent. <clears throat> Mardi Gras is celebrated with numerous parades and balls and other festivities during the season, but it's probably best known for the parades that roll through New Orleans every year. Uh, I mentioned the drunkenness. There's also all kinds of lewd activity at the parades, especially in New Orleans, but also in other places where Mardi Gras is celebrated. Uh, there's things like women flashing their breasts to get the beads and other trinkets that are thrown from parade floats. Some of the parades and floats, not all of them, not the majority of them, but some of them have um, the parades and the floats themselves have disgusting, sexually immoral themes and throws like they'll throw condoms or sex toys or cups and t-shirts with obscene sayings or pictures on them. That's, you know, like I said, that's not the majority of parades and floats, but it does happen. 
And then, of course, with all that alcohol uh, and a sexually charged atmosphere, you know there's going to be rampant yes. sexual immorality going on. And also, as you might expect, crime and violence surge during Mardi Gras. So attending the parades can be kind of dangerous. So is Mardi Gras biblical? Should Christians participate in it? Well, I hope after what I just described, you you know the answer to that, or at least have a little hint. Uh, almost categorically, and we'll get to the almost part in just a sec, almost categorically, Categorically, the answer to both of those questions is no. The drunkenness, sin, and lasciviousness that go along with the typical Mardi Gras celebrations are patently unbiblical. Ephesians 5.18 says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And then 2 Timothy 2.22, so flee youthful passions. Youthful passions basically means, you know, impulsive fleshly desires. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. In other words, don't indulge your flesh with the Mardi Gras crowd. Go be holy with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And this sort of fleshly theology that says, go out and wallow around in all the sin you possibly can before you have to start being good. You know, I hope we don't have to tell you that that's antithetical to Scripture, too. Uh, Romans 6, 1 through 2 says this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And then you scroll a few or (laughs) scroll. You look a few more verses down in chapter six of Romans and you see verses 12, 12 through 14. And it says this. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Christians should not participate in any sinful activities any day of the year, including Mardi Gras, nor should Christians believe or portray to others by their actions the unbiblical so-called theology behind Mardi Gras. Now, All of that being said, in Louisiana and a few other places where it's celebrated, Mardi Gras is much more of a cultural holiday than any sort of religious observance. People from various religions as well as non-religious people participate in Mardi Gras. And for them, it's just a fun time that has nothing to do with Ash Wednesday or Lent because they don't believe in or participate in those observances. And the same goes for something like king cake. It's, you know, it's just what you eat this time of the year if you live in Louisiana. It has no more moral or religious underpinnings for us than eating crawfish during crawfish season, which is coming up, by the way. (laughs) Uh, But a lot of smaller towns and even some larger ones reject the debauchery that takes place in New Orleans, and they'll offer family-friendly parades, which are basically just as innocuous as our local Christmas parades or a Fourth of July fireworks show. So for Christians who have worked and prayed through the appropriate biblical principles— and whose consciences allow them to participate in non-sinful Mardi Gras activities, such as attending these these sort of family-friendly parades, this is very much an issue of adiaphora, or Christian liberty, similar to participating in non-sinful aspects of Halloween. And if you want to hear more about that, we made a... a, 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 a an episode of the podcast about Christian liberty, and we talked about the Christian liberty to participate in non sinful aspects of Halloween. So we will link that up for you in the show notes. And may I say also that also similar to Halloween, it's a great witnessing opportunity, Mardi Gras is. So my Louisiana friends, if you go to or participate in a family friendly, non sinful Mardi Gras parade this year, be sure to take some tracks to hand out to the people around you. Or, you know, if you're on a on a parade float, include those tracks with the throws from your float. Yes, wherever we go and whatever we do, we always want to be about the business of sharing the gospel. So this year, when you hear someone talking about what she's giving up for Lent 
or you see someone with ashes on her forehead or Mardi Gras beads around her neck, or even just somebody eating pancakes or chewing on little plastic babies. <laughs> ha, take that as an opportunity and a reminder to share the good news of Jesus with her. And as we bring things to a close, Michelle, I want to read a thank you note from one of our listeners. Her name is Erica. She's a friend of mine. And uh, she wrote this to me. She said, I just listened to that episode on singleness. Thank you so much for seeing us. I found myself nodding along as other women recounted their experiences with singleness. I'm a lot younger than most of them, and I'm so thankful for how my own church leaders recognize the contributions and value of singles in our church. But the struggle is still very real for most women being married and thus forgetting the loneliness that often accompanies singleness. It can be so frustrating to feel left out of the conversations or out of the church's ministries since so many of them are aimed at marriages and families, which are still very important. Thank you so much for emphasizing that singleness truly is a gift from God. I need to remind myself of that frequently and for encouraging the marrieds and the singles to love each other well. I certainly hope to be married one day, but I'm learning the lesson of being grateful for where the Lord has placed me in life. It's allowed me ministry opportunities I probably wouldn't have if I were married. And he knows best always. Well, he certainly does. That's right. And also, before we go, we want to say a special thank you to Carl, who sent us a generous gift through PayPal. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. And if you'd like to support us like Carl did through PayPal or through Patreon, head on over to a wordfitlyspoken.life and click on the support tab. And while you're there, be sure to click on the podcast tab and check out all the great resources we've listed in the show notes for this episode if you'd like to learn more about any of the things that we've talked about tonight. And we would also love it if you would click on the speaking tab. You want the dynamic duo of doctrine and discernment to come speak at your women's event? Well, Amy and I are available and ready. So reach out to us and let's chat about it. And until next time, laissez le bon temps rouler and walk worthy. <music>